Welcome to Measures of Truth, a His Dark Materials podcast. I'm Caitlin. I'm Alan. I'm Francis. And I'm Anya, and today we're discussing chapters 1 through 3 of The Subtle Knife, the second book in the His Dark Materials trilogy. summarize the chapters that we are talking about with chapter one the cat and the horn beam trees a 12 year old random boy we've never seen before where did he come from i wasn't expecting this named will perry takes his mentally ill mother to stay with his former piano teacher and then returns home to search for a stash of letters from his missing father just as will finds the letters some mysterious men that have been surveilling the house and harassing his mother return and break into the house when will tries to escape one of the men trips on will's cat and falls to his death Will goes on the run and ends up in Oxford. Standing on the side of the road, he watches a different cat seemingly disappear and follows it through a window into another world. The world has buildings and shops with food, but seems completely deserted. Will searches for a place to sleep and is attacked by Lyra, who has already taken refuge in the house he was exploring. They stop fighting, chat about demons and dust, and then Will cooks them dinner. Will goes to bed and Lyra asks the alethiometer if she can trust Will. It replies that he's a murderer, and she is comforted. Okay, chapter two, Among the Witches. Amid the chaos resulting from Lord Azrael opening the portal to another world, Seraphina Pecola encounters the demon of another witch that has been captured by the Magisterium. Seraphina sneaks onto the ship where the witch is being held and makes herself invisible to spy on a meeting where Mrs. Coulter and a bunch of Magisterium officials are talking about Lyra and the prophecy. The committee goes back to the witch to torture and interrogate her, and she eventually cries out for the goddess of death. Seraphina mercy kills the other witch, fights her way out of the ship, and then goes to visit the witch ambassador in Trollicent, who informs her that the Magisterium is assembling a giant army. Seraphina then goes to the science cabin and saves Lord Asriel's manservant, Thorold, from cliffgasts. He tells her what he's gleaned from Asriel's research, that Asriel's not only trying to go to war with the church, but kill the authority, also known as God. The world declines to be rescued, and Seraphina returns home for a witch's council meeting. Notable attendees include Lee Scoresby, who did not decline to be rescued at the end of book one, and Ruta Scotti, a Latvian witch queen. Ruta brags about fucking Lord Asriel and wants to search for him so she can join forces with him against the church. Lee says he's going to search for the mysterious Dr. Grumman, who seems to have an important role in all of this. Seraphina and a gaggle of witches from the various clans join together to go into the New World and search for Lyra. And in Chapter 3, named A Children's World, Will and Lyra chat about the differences between their worlds. Lyra wants to travel to Will's world and find a scholar in his Oxford to ask about the multiverse. They run into two children who tell them the city they're in is called Sitagatza, or Sigatza and explain why it's abandoned. Every so often it's played by invisible beings called spectres that eat the life out of adults but leave children alone. The adults have abandoned the city and are waiting for the spectres to leave before returning. The next day, Lyra and Will find the window he came through and pass into his Oxford. Lyra doesn't understand how fast vehicles go in this world and immediately gets hit by a car. But somehow both she and the alethiometer are unharmed. As Lyra gets her bearings on Broad Street, recognising Balliol College in the Bodleian Library, she realises that Jordan College doesn't exist in this Oxford and begins to panic. And that's the end so far. So just to have a quick recap here, um, when we do our book episodes, we don't do spoilers. 
just reminding our listeners and um, mostly myself because I'm real bad about that. And I believe, uh, Anya, you've only read to the end of this book, correct? You have not read the third book? I have not read the third. I mean, I have read the third book, but it was many years ago and I remember literally nothing. (laughs) Great. So now let us go into our general feelings about how this book has started off in these first three chapters. What did we think? What just did we feel? Get, just, mm? I just need to get one spoiler out of the way. Um, I'm sorry, Anya, uh, but uh, Dumbledore dies. <gasps> it's okay. All classes are online from now on, so. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Oh, God. Oh, my God. Can we please write a, uh, a piss take of Harry Potter, which is actually... <laughs> It's actually in a pandemic. <laughs> um, we should put out a disclaimer. We're recording this on March 18th. And so any pandemic jokes are uh, in that era. Yeah. Uh, self-therapy. Yeah. That being said, uh, Anya, your first four general feelings here. I thought this was a really strong start um, to the book. I was immediately interested in Will and what was going on with him and his mom. Um, And I thought that Pullman managed to add in his backstory in a way that was actually pretty engaging, and it spoke to um, his character as much as it was uh, kind of like an exposition dump. Um, It didn't really feel that way at all. And I also really loved the way that Will and Lyra kind of collided, both metaphorically and literally, and their interactions in that chapter are just so perfect. Uh, yeah, I feel pretty much the same. Um, as much as I love the Golden Compass, I feel like we're not really in his dark materials until we get Will and Lyra. But I, I do recall the first time I read this, I hated the opening because I was like, where the fuck is Lyra? Who is this stupid boy that I don't give a shit about? Um, but now <laughs> when I read it, because I, I do know Will so well, it feels like this is when the overarching plot and the theme and everything just really starts here. It's like coming home to my favorite books because that's a uh, that's what these are. That's very cool. I was definitely going to ask you about like your first experience of reading the book because it was like what struck me going through this time was how bold this is for like a direct sequel and how no one does this and how like I can't imagine the talks with the editor unless he just has the coolest editor in the world because this is not how you do this. It's like a totally new character in a totally different setting that's not a fantasy setting as a follow-up to your fantasy book. And then you switch in chapter two to supporting characters from the previous book. And it's like, <laughs> what, what is going on? Um, I just love how like all of that's wrong, but it works to kind of expand the boundaries of the fictional universe. And uh, it tells you a lot about like, what this book is going to be and like how big everything's going to get. I can understand it. It didn't work for people, but it was, I thought it was cool. How many best selling books do you have to write before you can tell your editor to just like fuck off JK Rowling or George R. R. Martin style? You can kind of look at her books and see how big they get. What do you, what do you think? Four? I think five, <laughs> four maybe. I don't know about best selling, but Philip Pullman did have a very popular series before this one that sold quite well. I don't know if it was like New York Times bestseller because back then oh. it was much harder to get on the New York best. Oh the New yeah, York Times, um, but um, Ruby and the Smoke and the that whole series. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. So oh. I, he probably I don't know off the top of my head if it had the same editor, but if it did, it would have been somebody that he already worked with quite a bit and probably would have trusted him. Even so, I mean it's a gamble. Like the Golden Compass was a big hit and I don't, I respect this. I respect the hell out of this. Like it's, this is bold and I'm sure it pissed people off at the time. And like, to me, that's also kind of cool because I think it works. I do love the fact that it is a cold open essentially. And to see someone do it in book form is actually relatively novel, if you'll pardon the pun. <laughs> it, but yeah, it's it's nice. It's nice to see this sort of cold open followed by a, like some pretty cool exposition of the world that is around or maybe more the multiverse. So kind of looking at little bits and bobs before 
properly diving in. And then also, I really, really liked how they took Lyra and made her not the protagonist very briefly. This is Will, and Will encounters this feral-seeming girl who is a bit rude, a bit odd. And then it turns out that this strange feral girl living in a shack is in fact Lyra, who we've been following for an entire book and have grown to know and maybe love. And you get a very different kind of perspective on that. It's just cool. You can really see a lot of her class bias come out here in an interesting way from Will's perspective, right? Because like... Will is so domestic, like, he's been taking care of his mom, and, like, the home is kind of, like, a domain where he's very comfortable, and, like, and Lyra's like, oh, I have servants for that. (laughs) She's, like, never had to really take care of herself in her whole life. It's amazing how spoiled she seems as soon as she's interacting with someone vaguely of her own age. Mm Mm-hmm. And whereas, like, everyone in The Golden Compass was really like, oh, this girl, she's so amazing, like, she's so competent, I, like, she's charismatic, I want to do whatever she says, I'll follow her to the ends of the earth. And Will's like, girl cannot even cook a fucking omelet. Well, like, pointing that out, they both seem very their age when they interact. Yeah. Because I feel like for a lot of The Golden Compass, Lyra either felt way younger than she actually is, or like she was doing things somebody much older would be doing. But as soon as she's with Will, who is somebody that she very quickly accepts as an equal and not an adult or a kid that she can just take control of, they both feel 12. They sort of realize that they have to help each other out of necessity. Neither of them are like, we want to help each other. <laughs> I think that's very 12-year-old. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's it's so much so obvious how much more mature Will is as a twelve year old. He might be thirteen. Sorry. Oh uh, yeah, I, I, th- I, I think I he is remember. a little bit older. Yeah. Lyra has seen some real shit, and yet is also so mind numbingly straightforward. I think. Mm-hmm. And Will is very understanding of the complexities of life and humanity. I know we talked a lot in the Golden Compass about how lying was a good characteristic in Lyra. Like it was presented as something noble in her that she was good at and it got her what she what what we wanted, what she wanted, what the world wanted, whatever. But looking back on it, I think it was Will who taught me that you could be a liar and a good person. Because he <laughs> has spent his whole life lying to everyone about who he is, about what's going on. And like who everything about him is just one big lie basically that he very purposely cultivates. And as as a kid, I did something very similar in high school because I didn't want anybody to know me. And I think, like, reading about Will, he's always been who I identified the most with in these books. And looking back at it now, it, that's why. Because he was such a good liar in a completely different way than Lyra is. Yeah, I think that's part of what this book does so well is take the previous book and kind of turn it mm-hmm. inside out. Lyra's lies are about taking the people around her and molding them into what she needs in the moment. But Will is able to like kind of mold himself. When these two are together, it's really interesting because that doesn't work on like Lyra has eyes on him always. She's always sees him and he is not under her control and like their shit does not work on each other. And it's it's cool. That's an interesting point because like you're right. Almost right away, Will doesn't try to hide anything about himself from her. Like, he just doesn't even try. They're both just like, what What are you? And then they both kind of tell each other. I feel like if you end up in a completely different world, you're kind of like out of your element so much that it's almost like hard to lie because you don't know what your story is supposed to be. I don't know, man. Will like gets naked, goes for a swim. And just walks in and is like, I'm going to go that cafe and I'm going to cook up. Who the fuck is this? Get off me, bitch. And then he's like, yeah, I'm going to cook dinner and go to bed. And she's she's like, no, I want to go do this thing. He's like, yeah, after I sleep, like Will seems fine. He seems like he's cool. All right. If we've all uh, covered how our general feelings and kind of uh, then some in our traditional way, let's move on to our favorite part. Uh, Francis gets to start because he never starts. All right, I'll uh, I'll happily start with my favourite part. Um, I think that aside from the obvious awesome Seraphina Peckler moment on the ship where she sneaks in, 
it's it's like a video game level. It's it's so absurd, but it's so cool. It's the sort of thing which, if they'd have done the movie correctly, that would have been made into this crazy action sequence, and it would have been kind of a steady cam one shot thing the whole way through, which would be amazing. If any you know any of the guys in Bad Wolf listening. Do if you if you haven't shot that one already, please just one steady cam shot. That'd be so cool. But yeah, aside from that, my favorite part was actually a really small detail of how chapter three was written, where they uh, Lyra and Will go back and forth on the words that they use to describe certain things. So uh, initially physics or experimental theology, and then Anne Barrick versus electric. And they actually delve down a bit into the etymology of where these have come from, with electrum being a slightly odd usage of the word, but basically the word for amber, or another word for amber. And uh, electric being named after electrum versus amber being named after amber, both of which are named for the electrostatic properties of amber. You know, they are, in their own ways, exactly the same place, with the same languages, and yet they are so, 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 so different. It's just really cool. And it's really nice to see that actually actively addressed. Yeah, I agree. That aspect of the world building um, was some of my favorite parts of book one. So it's kind of cool to get to see the characters nerd out about it in the same way that the reader is kind of yeah. nerding out about it. By the reader, you just mean you. Yes. But, yeah. I mean, come on. <laughs> I feel like I'm the perfect representative of just your average person. Um, <laughs> How is that PhD? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so my favorite moment... The target YA audience. <laughs> <laughs> so my favorite moment is a uh, character beat for Lyra where uh, she asked the alethiometer if Will is a friend or an enemy and the alethiometer just says that he's a murderer. The text says, uh, when she saw the answer, she relaxed at once. A murderer was a worthy companion. She felt as safe with him as she felt with York Burness and the armored bear. It's just so perfect for describing Lyra's like completely unique and kind of like warped perspective just based on her life experiences and explains so much about everything she does going forward. Uh, originally, I know Ani had written about how she thought she might be stealing that moment from me, uh, but actually, Francis stole my favorite moment. Sorry. Yeah. When, <laughs> uh, although I think it's it's for completely different reasons than Francis wrote down because you said it was just a small moment. It's it's very specifically called out in the text that they they both remember this moment for a yeah. long time, and it's it's not a small yeah. moment. It does come back, and it is the first time you really see them connect. As opposed to be like, what the fuck is this other person, you know? And that's why I like it. Um, but because Francis stole it, I chose a different one, which is <laughs> when Will first sees the window and is looking through it, he immediately knew it was grass from a completely different world. And it says he knew it at once as strongly as he knew that fire burned and kindness was good. And I just really like that line and that... That's also the moment where if you are reading this for the first time, where you, you realize how the two stories are going to come together and why we're with this kid. And, and you're like, oh, he's going to go through. They're going to find each other. I get it. Cool. And you're good about that. And I, it is just a really good line. And I like it a lot. Seeing as this is a story written by Pullman, you know, against Catholicism and all that sort of thing. Kindness is one of the things that I've gotten into debates with my religious friends about because you can't be kind and good without somebody telling you what kind and good is but I've always thought that choosing kindness and goodness without somebody telling you you should is better and so I just like the use of that word here and it jumps out at me but maybe that's just me and because I have kind of a history of getting into arguments about people. No, I liked that line too. I'm listening to the audiobook version and Philip Pullman does all of the narration in it. And so I can hear his voice saying, uh, and, and kindness was good the way that he said yeah. it. He says it as this really concrete thing that's so interesting. That like something, like you said, that you doesn't need explaining. Fire burns. Kindness is good. That grass is from another fucking world. 
Right. Yeah. You just know it. I love that rule too in the universe. That's like a, a cool way to establish that. Like, I feel like that's an easy thing to trip over as a writer to try and get into some kind of, well, what would it be like for me? And it, it would, that would get cumbersome and bad. And that's, and he just avoids it. Yeah. So my favorite part out of this stuff was um, the Serafina chapter and how we get a deeper look into the witch culture, just everything about it, how she talks to the other demon and how she's able to kind of ninja her way around the magisterium meeting, which is like such an interesting way to use the um, point of view, you know, as a writer to have the point of view kind of embedded in this character who is in the room and has this like added tension of, I need to control my emotions. I need to be in control of myself so that I'm not discovered by these people. Like usually we're just kind of passively watching. You could write this totally differently where we would just, you know, get to watch this conversation and it wouldn't have this added layer of tension to it. Uh, And then, you know, for it to break the way that it does at the end where, you know, like Francis said, it becomes a big action sequence And it's so cool, too, how the perspective is not just sticking with Will. It's going back to these side characters that we didn't get very much of in the first book and how they're like expanding to become more important. And we stay in touch with Lyra's world through them. Yeah, that's a good point. I really like that. And I think Philip Pullman made it like you said, it was risky the way that we went from not Lyra chapter to like side characters from the first book. But he he chose the side characters that everybody loved. You know, you, you've got mostly Seraphina's point of view. Mm-hmm. You've got a spattering of uh, balloon man. Lee. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Lee. Lee. Thank you. Sorry. Um, and, and you've got <laughs> and you've got Mrs. Coulter there being her fabulous evil self, uh, hurting people, which is what we hear like the best. Right. <laughs> is that the tagline for this one? <laughs> yeah. That's the first time that we see her with uh, with magisterium people too. We like we didn't get that in the first yeah. book. We didn't see her like interacting with that her peers, point, yeah. and she is like in charge. Yeah. Nobody is in charge of that meeting like she is. It will be less impactful in the show because we've already seen that. Which isn't to say that it won't be amazing, but it's just like it's so strong here because we, as you said, we've never seen it before. I mean, it will be amazing because it's Ruth Wilson, but. Yes. Hurt me. <laughs> um, I think that scene is also really interesting from a magic system perspective. I love the way that um, the way that she makes herself invisible. It's not trivial. Like it takes work and concentration and it's not perfect. And it's not like they actually see through her. It's just like it works on people's brains so that they choose not to notice it. Yeah. It's the magical expression of what Will yeah. is doing. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, like from from a Buffy episode, you know, like the girl who feels so unnoticed in the classroom becomes invisible. She literally, you know, isn't there anymore. It's the same kind of thing. I've talked a little bit on uh, the other show, Hallowed Ground Story Cast, about like different magic systems. I just I like it more when magic has a cost and when you can you like understand where the effort is and skill is coming from. Harry Potter magic is like my least favorite kind of magic, and this is I feel like kind of like on the opposite end of the spectrum from that. So yeah, least favorite parts. I am so mad that Philip Pullman made fucking Lord Asriel the thing to, like, make Ruta Scotty seem more cool and competent and powerful. Um, And I'm mad that for two of the three named character witches that we get that, like, have personal motivations, those motivations are primarily related to fucking a man. Um, I just feel like which you should have more going on than that. My uh, first inclination is to make a lot of excuses because I love these books and I love Philip Pullman's writing, but uh, no, you're absolutely right. It's bullshit. Yeah. Not only does like he use it from the narrator's perspective in the text to like make her seem badass, but then like he has her brag about it out loud to everyone else in the most awkward way possible. Yep. It's just unnecessary. 
What is this also tiger <laughs> killing? Oh. <laughs> So the other way he makes her seem badass is he talks about how she, like, murdered a bunch of tigers to, like, punish them because they, like, worshipped the tigers or something. And I feel like killing charismatic apex predators to teach someone else a lesson, I just, like, can't forgive that. Like, fuck her forever. You're dead to me if you kill tigers. (laughs) I've, like, blocked this out of my head. (laughs) I I also didn't like how they, like... They say halfway through, like, you know, Serafina respected Ruta for her fierce intellect and her beauty. And it's like, these are witches who are literally hundreds of years old, have loved and lost time and time again. And you're saying that one of the major drivers of her respect for this queen is her beauty. Eh, it just... It stuck out to me as obviously clumsy, and I don't know if it's just that the writing doesn't always age super well here, but it just stuck out to me. It does feel very written by a man who has no idea what a society of women would be like, and didn't bother to ask any women. Yeah. Although, okay, just to play devil's advocate, like, I agree with everything we just said, but, like, just on the other hand, like, most women I know, if they make themselves look very nice... They don't give a shit what men think. They want to know what other women think. If he'd wanted to do it, I could see where there was perhaps a way to have done it, but he did not get there. If that was the implication, then... No, no, yeah, yeah, no, it's not at all that, I don't think. (laughs) But I'm just saying that I personally, as a woman, value compliments from women way more than men. In fact, I I don't give a shit what men think about how I look. So there's that. Fair. I guess as the other woman here, I should chime in and say yes to all of that. The, it does not have a, like, yeah, you go, girl. Like, you look amazing. Let's go out and, like, hit the clubs vibe. No, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. not. I was just, <laughs> as we were speaking, it kind of occurred to me that, that I was like, actually, no, I, like, anyway, no, it does not come across that way at all in his writing. Yeah, that that one didn't actually make it past the, uh, past the editor. They were friends, but they, they got rid of the club sequence. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they hit up the witch gay bars for six days. Man, that Wait, sounds, this, this sounds like awesome. the best fucking time. <laughs> oh, especially since all witches are women, all witch bars are gay bars, so... They're playing the classics from 1400 years ago. Wait, that's exactly my jam. <laughs> I am ready for this. <laughs> it's still Bon Jovi. Oh, Jesus, never mind. <laughs> I don't really have anything in particular that stood out as a dislike. A lot of my least favorite things about this book kind of started in this chapter, but they're not really going to come to fruition until later. I do hate Ruta Scatty, but it's because of something that happens later. But every word that comes out of her mouth, I want her dead. I hate her. (laughs) (laughs) Aside from that, my other like major problem is another language based point this year this year, this episode. <sighs> Considering that Sagatsa is named in Italian, why do they speak fluent English? This is ridiculous. They don't speak fluent English, they are Italian. We are not in Oxford. We are in Italy. This is obvious. The architecture is you know, I, I kind of get Florence vibes, I guess. I completely agree, Francis. Especially because the whole language point is even lampshaded by the fact that Will and Lyra have a conversation about the fact that they both speak English and how miraculous it is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So that just seems like a middle finger to the reader in terms of the world building with the little children running around Sagatsa. And I never got it the first time. It was only this read through that I noticed it. I just thought Italian was like, it's a me, Mario. Like, you know, <laughs> wait, that's not Italian? <laughs> oh, okay, God. so the, the, what was I going to I I have a potential in world explanation. It does have spoilers, though, so we can't speak about it. I, I agree that it is stupid and dumb, but you, I do have a headcanon you could accept for yourself. Um, which we can talk Do about Do they later. have fish living in their ears? No, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no babelfish. Babelfish? Whatever the fuck. 
That's where their demons are. Oh, all their in... demons are babble oh. fish. Yeah, Smart. fish in their ears. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. All right, Alan, it's your turn for what you hated. I dislike this. I don't hate it. I don't like the narrator, especially with how kind of almost horror movie we're getting and how this feels like kind of a thriller story. It it just doesn't work for me in terms of like that kind of narrator comes from a tradition of like the Narnia books, Alice in Wonderland, uh, you know, when you're talking about YA fiction or kids fiction. And the reason that the narrator is that way, the reason that they occasionally intrude on the narrative and say things like, they would both remember this conversation for a long time into the future is because it's like when it, when that happens in Alice in Wonderland, it's because it's funny. It's because the narrator comes in and says, you know, like, and, and we will go to war and we will win. And then the narrator's like, they don't, they don't <laughs> win. They're losers. You know, it's like, it's to undercut what what's happening. It's not to like it. It just doesn't work here for me. I would much rather be in a close third person with each of our characters, even if we're swinging from person to person. I'd be fine with that. But I don't want these interjections from a kind of objective narrator who tells me, you know, every once in a while they would remember this for the rest of their lives or something like that. It, I don't think it works. I never even would have noticed if you hadn't brought it up. Yeah, I was about to say, I don't think I noticed that at all, but I'm glad you pointed it out. Yeah, thanks for making us super aware, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Yeah. laughs> English majoring it up. All right. Um, we Now we've got our problematic section. Nobody wrote anything down, but I did think, I don't think we really got into the problematics of it in this chapter, but zombies were mentioned. And that is going to, of course, be more of that whole mysticism from Africa BS that we talked a lot about in the first one. All right. Uh, with that, I think Alan has his uh, newly name changed section. Oh, I made that section. Oh, I didn't make this at all. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, that was all me. Uh, somebody, so somebody just now changed the name. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Anyway, so now we've got teleology watch. Oh, I just got it. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> or Sorry. teleology alethiometer, which is funny if you take watch for its other definition, I suppose. <laughs> That's the best I'm going to give you, Francis. I will take that. <laughs> Humbly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I guess as I was reading these chapters, I was just trying to notice uh, to what extent will the character um, seem to be on some sort of teleological journey that mirrored Lyra's. And there were a few places where it seemed like Will had some sort of like preternatural sense for like what he should be doing um, or was like led into a certain direction by destiny. So the first one was when he... Um, wakes up in his house after taking the nap and he like immediately knew where to find the letters and then I guess also that there were people breaking and downstairs but that makes sense that he could have heard them obviously uh, the second one was once he's in Sagatsa he picks out the cafe where Lyra is hiding and decides to go in there um, and the text says uh, he kept moving down the waterfront until he found a little cafe that looked like the right place. He couldn't have said why. It was very similar to a dozen others. And then the third one was once he's inside the cafe, and it says, uh, Something made his skin prickle before he opened the last door. His heart raced. He wasn't sure if he'd heard a sound from the inside, but something told him that the room wasn't empty. So again, it's like... <laughs> something. Something. Hey. Yeah, so it's just like... He seems to be led by Destiny to make all of the right decisions in the same way that Lyra kind of was in the last book. My thing about this is, and I can't believe we're having this whole teleology thing and Alan hasn't spoken yet, but I, I assume we'll get to him. When Whenever we discussed teleology before, it felt like something we were discussing outside of the writing or outside of the story, I guess. Like, Philip Pullman wrote it this way because he's sort of biased to write it that way. But with these ones, especially the one where the second one, he kept moving down the waterfront 
to the cafe, blah, blah, blah. That feels more like Philip Pullman's very conscious of it. He's writing it because Mm -hmm. there's a force within the story pushing Will. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. By force, you mean dust. Well, we're going to delve into that, but that's how it feels. I think that uh, this is like a direct like reference to Tolkien and to C.S. Lewis to the way that they write in their books. Just like in the previous book, we had the uh, the wardrobe that she gets into. This is the kind of thing when you're le- reading Lord of the Rings, where Tolkien is just like underlining that like these are not coincidences; it is fated. Like it, we are being led by providence. Uh, and, you know, in C.S. Lewis, it's like you hear Aslan in your heart and you, you're led along the way. And I think Pullman is like very deliberately he's uh, it's almost exactly the way that Tolkien would write it. Like, I don't know why, but I, I ought to go in there and I do. And then like, boom, oh, the crazy thing happens and I don't put the pieces together. See, this is why I really enjoyed things like uh, Red Shirts by John Scoutsy. He writes with this almost fourth wall breaking self referential humor the The first perspective you see is of a, a kind of classic Star Trek red shirt, and he's just thinking how absurd the situation that he's in is, and then he gets eaten by a sandworm and it's It's brilliant <laughs> right. because it's looking at all of this stuff and saying, "How do I know this and then the the whole book is looking at this same question of. I almost would have loved to see it if he'd have been like, this just feels right. And then he goes in there and there's nothing in there. Or like, it's worse. It's just like full of shit because the sewers have broken. <laughs> like, you know, something like that. I, I want to see this sort of arbitrary belief in the story being punished because it's unrealistic. Obviously, most of this is unrealistic, but like, I don't, I find it clumsy writing. I may really, really regret saying on a recorded show that I find things which are <laughs> evocative of Tolkien and C.S. Lewis to be clumsy writing. Maybe C.S. Lewis is a bit clumsy, but Tolkien... Mm, oh no, no I really to- can't say to- that, but... Tolkien is clumsy as shit. I have a whole podcast dedicated to how he's not as good at... Well, how he's not as serious of a writer of, of how people think he is, because why do we need five goddamn pages about the trees? But anyways, carry on. He's a nerd. He's just a nerd about his own shit. It's yeah. slightly strange, but yeah, no. I like. I find. I, I I wrote here. I cannot just accept dust as a Deus ex machina. Yep. So there's a force which is telling him that he needs to go in there. It's like it, it feels like it's written by a bad fan fiction writer. And I've read some good fan fiction writers, and I've read some very bad fan fiction writers. So my thing about that is that's literally what the alethiometer is it's somehow it seems less absurd when there's when it's accepted by the story when it's accepted and obviously addressed by saying hey she's got this know everything device like Mm. i can accept the know everything device not addressing it directly it just feels clumsy even though I, i i do know that you can kind of reason that out ad hoc later they could have gone for a paddle boat ride together it could have been so cute (laughs) <laughs> they just just skip the whole of Sagatso and they just join the two like tears together and then they just appear in each other's worlds and they go, huh, wouldn't it have been really inconvenient if we met up in another world in the middle? <laughs> <laughs> but they all continue on. I don't know. To me, it doesn't feel clumsy because the whole book is about destiny and about how Lyra is going to kill destiny. I was um, just going to say. So it's, it feels right. like it's speaking to theme in a meaningful way. I don't know how the trilogy ends, so I can't say whether it's ultimately satisfying, but for now, it feels fine to me. But surely that then implies if Lyra's aim and Lyra's destiny is to defeat destiny, then destiny is pushing Lyra to defeat itself, which is I mean, destiny odd. could be suicidal. I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> so like i i think it's good that you notice this i i guess that's what i m- meant when i was talking about tolkien i'm not saying that like this is good because it is like tolkien i'm saying that he is like lampshading 
hey, these aren't coincidences. Like you, you think that they're coincidences, but they're not coincidences in the same way that Tolkien does. And I think that he's doing that on purpose, not as like an homage to Tolkien in, in the same way that like the, the closet is not an homage to C.S. Lewis. It's like, hey, C.S. Lewis is a fuck. And, <laughs> and the idea of providence in the universe that someone is guiding your steps along is a fuck. And it's not a good thing that's happening here. Like, I don't think that that's, that's what I mean is like, he's inverting this. It's not pro it's not God that's helping. Like, that's what's going on with Frodo is like, everybody goes to Elrond as a coincidence. And then Gandalf's like, it's not a coincidence. It's God. It's providence. And Pullman is like, it's a fuck. That's fucked. And I don't like it. And yeah. And, and I'm showing you that I don't like it in this story. I think, I, I think thinking of particularly again, C.S. Lewis and Philip Pullman is in a manner in certain ways, complete opposites of each other. Or maybe thinking right. of Pullman's writing style as a re direct reaction to C.S. Lewis is quite an interesting one. Tolkien maybe slightly less so because he, his writings are slightly less obviously Christian. He has like in that book that I read about writing, he has so many Tolkien thoughts of like Tolkien is a fuck. <laughs> um, so like he he does not like Tolkien maybe at he, all. I wonder if he drink. I wonder if he went to drink in the same place that they used to drink in because I went there recently. I in Oxford, it's called the Black. Some... Oh, the Inklings. Yeah, in Oxford. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the eagle and the child. The eagle and child. Yeah, it's um, really good pies. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> I do in enjoy a really good pie. Anyways, any other teleology? Great, I've got a new section. <laughs> <laughs> How many sections and can we add? <laughs> one million. Anyways, this one is going to be small for now. So this one I call Dust Watch because... Well, okay, a little bit of a spoiler. Caitlin has never been satisfied with the definition or the answers that we get surrounding dust. So I want us to pay specific attention to it through this book and the next and discuss it a lot and see what we actually think dust is at the end. That's a good idea, definitely. Yeah, I'm excited. In rereading this book, I, I have yeah. thoughts about it. So I'm excited so that's about That's why this. I'm putting this in. Uh, we didn't get too much in this chapter other than Lyra's looking for it. She's going to find some uh, uh, scholars. I can't remember her word. I'm just coming up with scientists, scholars and or scientists about it. And Will has kind of pointed her, theologist, yes, uh, pointed her in the <laughs> correct direction for looking for a scientist in his world and not uh, a theologian, theologian, however you want to pronounce that. But we didn't get anything resembling answers just yet. I mean... I guess, no, we can't. Never mind, never mind. I was going to say, do we all want to put in a guess? But that doesn't make sense because some of us have finished the series. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to science? It seems like there was not a lot of science in this section. I mean, they did literally travel between worlds with a cat oh. as a guide. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that's in our cats, cats, cats section. Ah, gotcha. If we want if we want to look at the science, then we can indulge this ever so briefly. In terms of the whole multiverse thing, it's not unrealistic, and we'll probably talk I guess end up talking about this a lot more as the whole multiverse thing becomes more and more important going through the books. There's some stuff in I guess kind of physics and quantum physics and general th astrophysics looking at this sort of thing is there any reason why you can't have multiple universes is there you know you've you've got the whole um trouser legs idea um sorry pants legs for all of you american based folks um oh. where you're looking at every decision splitting uh splitting essentially the event horizon into two possibilities and you don't know which you, you you can only ever take one of those two if they were kind of dichotomous dichotomous is that the right word yeah uh, yeah if they yeah if they were if they were dichotomous choice um then you always go down one but there's always 
you know, it could be that the universe splits every single decision or every single thing that happens the whole time. And, we, you know, it's an interesting thought. Obviously, that grows exponentially incredibly quickly. But, like, you know, the, what what limits the size of the universe? Functionally, nothing. What limits the space you have to put multiple universes next to each other? nothing because we don't we have no idea what's if there's anything outside of the universe and if there is what is out there so there's no reason why that space can't be infinite thus there's no reason why there can't be infinite universes of course this is a very much a layman biologist look at this with a slight interest in like astrophysics and the questions above that but like it's it's not unreasonable and then things like wormholes, which are kind of what the gates are, or the windows are kind of implied to be, places where these two things have somehow intersected. They are relatively reasonable. I mean, there's, there's again, there's nothing in physics that says that they can't exist, or certainly not a huge amount. I think you just need one extra dimension to fold space through. Yeah, yeah I don't <laughs> pretend to understand any of that. I would like to, to be get fair. A... I'm only pretending to understand. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That seems like a lot of physics works that way. Um, this is why I don't work on physics. Uh, in the Golden Compass, we did talk about the multi-world theories when Kaisa brought it up, but we didn't have a scientist. We had Caitlin trying to explain it, uh, and I brought up the cats actually because, um, like, Philip Pullman made it a cat specifically because of uh, what's his face, Schrodinger, the cat, the dead cat dude. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, nice. So if Schrodinger had made his metaphor about a dog, then Will would have had a dog and murdered the guy that way? What if if he'd made it about an Akapi? (laughs) Maybe. I mean, these are all infinite worlds that exist out there where the story is ever so slightly different. (laughs) Where Will has a house Akapi? Schrodinger's fucking porpoise. Imagine if it was like an anglerfish or something. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, Will came across a humpback whale in the middle of Oxford. He thought this was odd. If you put a humpback whale in a room, like one hundred percent, it's gonna die. No radioactive decay necessary. (laughs) Uh, yeah. So that was really the only science we got into in this one, I think. That multiple worlds do exist. I'm more excited for for later on some of the science sections that we'll get into, but yes. I don't. We don't need to contort ourselves to come up with fake science sections until then. No. All no. right. We we sh- no more more accurately. We really shouldn't. We're going to embarrass ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. It, it, Alan, you've got like a novel here under religion, so have at her. I will try to be quick. I I see. So many things going on in these early chapters. I'm excited about um, the philosophy that's happening here uh, and to finally like get into some atheist philosophy. If you're talking about atheist philosophy, you got to talk about Friedrich Nietzsche because he's the guy. He's the guy who said uh, God is dead and we killed him. Uh, so he is a big time atheist. <laughs> Uh, The thing about Nietzsche, though, that you might not know is that after he says that, he says, we have to take responsibility for it. And I feel like that is part of the theme here. You look at somebody like Asriel, who is definitely bad at taking responsibility for the things that he does. Um, You look at Lyra's entire childhood, or you look at the state of the world that he's left behind with this huge hole in it. And the magnetic, you know, uh, polarity of the world is getting thrown out of whack. There's warm air just, you know, filling in the Arctic and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So Nietzsche is all about personal responsibility? He really is, to be honest. Yeah, so I love Frederick Nietzsche. Um, I, I will say up front, he is pretty bad about women. Uh, I don't know if I would call him a misogynist, but he has his doubts about the capacity of women 
to understand any philosophy. Other than that, I don't think Nietzsche is very problematic. I just don't want to excuse that. I don't want to like go off here and say all these good things about Nietzsche and not acknowledge that right up front. Because I think that Nietzsche is the first millennial who ever lived. Okay. Yeah. He uh, pissed everyone off in his own time. Nobody liked him. And he uh, wrote in tweets and blog posts. And after he got fired from his academic job because he refused to believe in racism as a political theory, um, he basically made money writing a blog, except that people called them short arguments and aphorisms instead of tweets and blog (laughs) posts that they were. Uh, He is like a sarcastic, ironic writer who is very, very readable. He's very funny. Uh, He does not give a shit. And he's very angry and sanctimonious at everyone. So I think uh, some people might be worried that, are are you talking about a guy who was like a a Nazi? He was used by the Nazis as propaganda. So that's probably why you've heard that before. He died before World War I, so he never had a chance to give an opinion about the Nazis. Um, His sister, though, was a big anti-Semite and a huge fan of the Nazis. She was in charge of his writing after he died, and she edited uh, some of his material that was unpublished to like kind of support that way of thinking. But in his own time, like I said, the reason that Nietzsche was so unpopular was because he thought that anti-Semites were fuckfaces, and he was not quiet about it. And when she got married to the man that she did, who was an anti-Semitic guy, uh, he told her that, like, you've made a terrible decision and I'm I am very disappointed in you. Hmm. So there's that. Um, I don't think he would have been a fan of the Nazis <laughs> if you're worried. OK, so what does this have to do with uh, his dark materials? Uh, like I said, Nietzsche was kind of um, the proto existentialist. Existentialism is all about making yourself into who you are, not listening to what society tells you to do, but doing your own thing. Nietzsche um, has this thing about institutionalism. That's what he sees religion as. Kind of the magisterium would be a good example of this. Uh, Institutions have a good answer for everything in your life. Where does the universe come from? How do you fit into it? Where is it going? Where are you going? How does all this fit together? It has teleological answers for your life. uh, And you better not disagree with them or we'll kick you out of the club. But I want to be in the club. (laughs) Because otherwise you're not going to get any stuff, you know. He, he saw things as kind of like a pyramid so that institutionalism would be at the bottom of the pyramid, like kind of like the food pyramid. What's the bottom of the food pyramid? Like pizza. That's this is my food pyramid. And then like the middle is like chocolate and the top is cocaine or something. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, that's what I eat every day. <laughs> institutionalism is down there at the bottom. It's the biggest uh, part of society. Most people are born into institutions and they remain in them. They are kind of inured to the possibility that life offers something outside of uh, what you've been told. Uh, And that's not just religion. Nietzsche was actually more worried about the emerging nationalism that was happening in Europe. If you think about the Golden Compass in terms of institutionalism, I think you can kind of see that Um, You can institutionalize yourself. I think this is the most common thing that people do. You tell a story to yourself about your life, that Lyra tells herself this story that uh, Lord Asriel loves her because he is her father. And she picks up all of these father figures along the way, and she projects their qualities onto Lord Asriel again and again and again. And she lives inside of this fantasy of this like institutional story that she's telling herself. And then at the end of the story, she comes up against the reality of who Lord Asriel is. He's not that person. And we already talked about that kind of failure and how it shatters, you know, that that image that she has. For Nietzsche, what was happening across Europe was that Christianity had lost its hold culturally on people. But then just like Lyra 
Daddy Asriel doesn't love me. What do I do? And her answer is, I'm Lyra Silvertongue. It's the same story with a different flavor. Now Yorick is my dad, right? This is the identity that someone else set up for me. I'm going to hide in that because I am hurting right now. I am scared. I don't know what anything means because my meaning in life is gone. And he saw Europe doing the same thing. As Christianity fell away, nationalism was stepping into the same role and telling you who you are, what you should be doing, and like what it's all about. You know, if you live in America, it's manifest destiny. It's head west, baby, and kill those Indians. Take the land, take the gold, kick the Mexicans out. And that's kind of like what happens with Lyra on a certain level. She loses that story and enters into, I think, the the kind of second level of the pyramid that Nietzsche is most famous for. Um, he calls nihilism. This is the idea that like, nothing has any meaning. And it's a, a place of fear, existential dread, right? Like, what if there was a worldwide pandemic, and you didn't know if you should be going to work or not, or if you know, you should be taking care of your kids instead of going to work or checking on your parents or uh, just as a random example of a thing that I was gonna you know, say when you said happen. existential dread, I feel so very close to that right now. <laughs> Like my yeah. whole days are just, what am I even doing? What does any of this matter? Are you, yeah. are you okay? Because that, that <laughs> institution has fallen away, right? Yeah. Well, and we've realized just how much so many of our institutions don't give a shit about us. Yeah. And so, you know, the, the story that those are the best things for us or those are the natural things that will take care of us and that, you know, self-interest is the best way to keep everybody safe, blah, 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 blah. Like these stories don't hold up. Uh, and then when you're faced with, well, then what do I do? Like, that's the feeling of nihilism. That, And Nietzsche believed that some people just stay there. They just stay in a place where none of it matters. I guess I'm just going to go to work and punch in and punch out. I'm going to uh, not try, you know. And the thing is, like, there was other philosophers who came before him who, like, got to the place of nihilism. And they were like, this is it, baby. We got here. This is the best, right? You don't have to believe all this bullshit. And you don't have to believe in anything. You're not responsible for anything anymore. Woohoo! And Nietzsche's like, this sucks. This is like adolescent bullshit. This is angst. Fuck this. And he said, there's a higher level that you can go to. And he called it the will to power. Where And this is basically existentialism. He didn't get a chance to like work this out because he died uh, young, youngish. Um, he could have lived on until the actual existentialist came along and probably could have been their mentor. Basically, he calls it the will to power because he doesn't have a better name for it. And when I was reading this book, I was like, hey, there's a character named Will. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, I didn't even think about that. Because we talked about yeah. how Lyra sounds like a liar. Right. And will is like, yeah, Will. Will power. Huh. And he's, he's never called William or anything like that. He's just Will. Yeah. And so like I saw the way that Will is kind of, you know, moving through the world, right? We talked about this, how he doesn't want to be seen by people and therefore he's not seen by people. Um, he wants to escape from whoever these mysterious people are that invaded his home. And he escapes to the degree that he goes to another universe. Like that's a uh, a pretty deep escape. I think that that's kind of like, like I was saying earlier about the girl in Buffy who turns invisible because she feels so unseen. That's kind of like the metaphorical expression of Will's, you know, desire to escape manifest literally in the story in a kind of magical way. But then you see that happen with Serafina too, where she can literally become invisible because of her willpower. And this is exactly the kind of thing that Nietzsche was talking about, not with magical powers, but with like, you know, you, uh, whatever you want to do in life, you make it happen for yourself. Um, and, and it doesn't matter what the rules of society are. It matters what your rules are. Like, that's how I see kind of the witch culture 
is more in line with this kind of will to power. Um, the, that's who those people are as people, like as a culture, they're a culture of people who are like self-defined, who exist with each other, like in the community in that we are all the same type of person, but not in like an institutional narrative where we all need to do this or that, if that makes sense. But I don't think that Will is necessarily starting out in this kind of highest level of Nietzsche's uh, will to power. He's just a good example right now of, of that kind of thing. I think he also has stories that he's telling himself about being a murderer, because that's a little ridiculous, right? I mean, we didn't talk about that. So I, I think he's still living inside of, of some stories. He's, he explicitly is telling himself stories early on, right? He's telling himself stories about my father was an explorer, and one day I'm going to go out there and join him, and he was important, and therefore I'm important. So he's caught up in his own kind of story right now. Well, and his whole relationship with his mom is all about, like, narratives and perspective and framing things and he has like these huge paradigm shifts at several points in his childhood good yes exactly yeah where it's like drastically changing the way that he sees himself in the world through the story of like there are people yeah. after us and then oh it's not it's a story that she believes so this is important to her like he has a very sophisticated understanding of her through yeah, yeah through the stories and I think that Lyra has like passed into the nihilism. And I see that as like, that's kind of what Sidigatse is as a metaphor. Like here's this big empty place where nothing matters. Like Will is paying the bills as they go. And she's like, what are you doing? Like nothing matters. <laughs> that's stupid. Uh, and he's like, well, it matters to me. And so he's still kind of living in the story and she's kind of living in the nihilism. She's, I, I really think that Lyra is like searching and that makes her feel like a little bit of a different character. And I'm sure unsatisfying on a certain level, but I actually find this very satisfying that she went through this big trauma and now she's like reeling from it and she's trying to find her direction. And here is this kind of like very aimed boy who you know like he seems like he's got his shit together and and she's like i'm gonna you know ride coattails here for a little while until i get my head on straight um that feels real to me that feels very real i have a lot to say on that particular subject but i'm gonna save it for later like i agree with what you just said but i think we're gonna have a lot to say about it in a couple chapters i agree that's what i saw with Will and Serafina and where Lyra's at. And I don't think it's an accident that his name is Will and that all of this kind of stuff is happening. I don't know if he was specifically thinking about this, but I find it like consistent with Nietzsche's kind of psychological framework. I also really liked as much as Will and Lyra are very different and have had very different lives. They did have that similarity of imagining their father Oh, yeah. Ooh, yeah. And, and imagining the adventures mm. that they would go on with their father. And I don't even know if that ever comes up in conversation between them. I don't actually think it does. But I think having that shared background helps them really understand one another. Mm -hmm. I also really liked your point about uh, Lyra's new name and how she's kind of like substituting Yorick for Lord Asriel as her father like i guess in the golden compass we talked about it in terms of identity and like names and and like the power and meaning of names but i hadn't really thought about how closely linked like your your last name or your family name is to patriarchy and how mm -hmm. she is kind of like, replacing one father figure with another it's interesting that also the adults do the same thing like in uh chapter two when at the end of uh lee i nearly said balloon man again lee <laughs> finding like talking to his kind of little speech to the which is commune basically he points out that he sees her as a daughter figure 
um right. and he wants he kind of wants to take that role but i think also he acknowledges i'm not sure if he acknowledges directly here but we know that he knows yorick well and so he must acknowledge also that yorick sees himself sort of as a father slash mental figure slash stalwart guardian slash bodyguard to lyra it's not like people are vying for this attention but people are recognizing that this is actually something that she's lacking when maybe at that time it's not that lyra doesn't recognize it but doesn't recognize quite how influential that might be on her yeah and we only see that we, we kind of start seeing how much resentment she has for you know as she'll just pissing off you know later and later as it gets worse and worse oh he's a terrible father and actually, the whole thing of like her changing her name and stuff is like kind of exactly the point that I was trying to make in the Golden Compass about the bears just switching from one king to another and how dissatisfied I was with that because it is this kind of like Nietzschean institutionalism where you just swap one ideology for another. Uh, like, oh, we've followed this one king and now we're going to follow this other king and it doesn't matter that like we were eating vanilla ice cream and now we're eating chocolate ice cream. Wow, this is so different. But it's like you're just, you're just eating ice cream. Like it's it's actually really the same. <laughs> so let's move on before we're here forever. Mm-hmm. Too late. Okay. Well, earlier when we were uh, talking about the show, they in the show brought up uh, that Will's mom had a mental illness. You, Anya, were worried about how they were going to portray that. How do you feel it was portrayed here in this book? I thought they did a good job in the show. And I think the book actually is even better just because we can go into Will's perspective more deeply and and get that kind of background. Uh, We were talking about it before in the context of, of what Alan was saying about Nietzsche and story and narratives. Like, Will is so empathetic and understanding towards his mom and the way that he can really explain from her perspective like what she thinks is going on and then as he kind of gains awareness you know like when Will is talking about it right like she is having these kind of like paranoid delusions but she turns it into a game to try and not scare her son and then when Will realizes what's going on he turns it into a different kind of game to try and protect her the same way that she was trying to protect him. And, and he realizes that, you know, it is in her mind and not for real. Of course, then it ends up actually being for real to at least some extent. Um, I thought Pullman did a really good job of putting us in both of their perspectives and, and explaining it in a way where it's like yes she's clearly mentally ill but it's not it's not in like a dismissive or or shallow or you know like negative way yeah i agree and it, he also makes it very clear that will doesn't hold it against his mom or anything like that that he he loves her a lot he comes out and says that i think that it's like the portrayal of mental illness is overall you know, well done and relatively sensitively done. I, I guess this isn't a this isn't a problem. Uh, this is just a note, I guess. It's interesting how many different disorders she seems to have some elements of, which mm-hmm. it's you know it does happen. Plenty of things, you know, plenty of these sorts of mental disorders are comorbid, particularly things like depression and anxiety. Um, but she's she obviously has a serious amount of paranoia she obviously has a certain element of some something in the spectrum of ocd but again i'm not sure how much kind of schizophrenia slash paranoia and compulsive disorders are necessarily linked the only thing that sticks out to me is it's a little much and it almost feels too much for her not to be under serious, uh, for her and Will particularly, not to be under serious watch from people like social services. You know, if you if you had epilepsy and were disabled, for instance, you know, there, there's a distinct chance of having social services breathing down your neck saying, well, you know, we don't think that you're in any fit state to look after your children. And so it just the ever so slightly kind of tipped me saying, well, 
I, I would have thought that there would have been some intervention by by the state at this time. It, it, it feels a little bit over the top for him to be in in the only caring role. But also, I you know, it does happen. It absolutely does happen. It's just it's an extreme scenario, which but, but this whole thing's these these are all extreme scenarios, and I guess it works as a plot device. It's just it kind of stuck out to me as a lot for someone to deal with. But also, like all of the symptoms were a touch sort of not polarized, but they they were a very stereotypical sometimes expression of these sorts of things. But they're perfectly reasonable, and I did think that it was again relatively sensibly and relatively accurately done again from from my experience i feel like your social services must be better than ours i mean they're not they're not fantastic but they are <laughs> they i'm not not no disrespect to the people working in the social services you guys do a great job um but like there there's some policy problems i do think that like this portrayal of will like what i really appreciate about all of this stuff with the mental illness and especially with the with the thing that you're talking about Anya of him like sensing the game of it and then understanding that there's a game within the game and you know turning the narrative back around on her and then protecting her with a narrative that speaks to the fact that children are just people there's not like a special yeah. thing about children where they are like this sweet, innocent, blah, blah, blah. They just have less experience than adults. They're just as sophisticated. And once they are exposed, you know, to whatever experience, they're going to have like the same kind of sophisticated extrapolations and strategies and all of that kind of stuff. You know, Will is put under pressure. I mean, this is another very Nietzschean thing. Like, whatever doesn't kill you makes you stronger. He's the person who said that. And so he's put under this pressure, and he adapts to it. And that's something that people do, and that's what children are. They're just people. Uh, and we don't need to have this kind of, like, very special childhood that we're told, you know, in our culture is, like, and especially through, like, a kind of Western Christian culture is, like, this, you know innocence is uh, and virginity and things like that are to be held up as these things that should be preserved at all costs you know in a way that like damages people and yeah it, it, it like very clearly fights against that and i yeah i was just gonna say it's almost like you hit the theme of this series <laughs> right now <laughs> on the head <laughs> right there yes i uh i pulled two quotes that maybe you're jumping ahead a little bit actually <laughs> sorry sorry carry on um, I pulled two quotes that I thought um, I could just read really quickly. He realized how clever his mother had been to make this real danger into a game so that he wouldn't be alarmed, and how, now that he knew the truth, he had to pretend not to be frightened so as to reassure her. But sometime during the next few months, Will realized slowly and unwillingly that those enemies of his mother's were not in the world out there, but in her mind. That made them no less real, no less frightening and dangerous, it just meant he had to protect her even more carefully. I really like that one. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a certain amount of kind of stoicism to Wilk. To Wilk? Sorry. To Will. <laughs> <laughs> um, where... Uh, <laughs> yeah, you okay? Yeah, I don't know why that struck me as quite so funny, but <laughs> Wilk. <laughs> Good old Wilk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's 4 a.m <laughs> yeah um, no um th there's there's a certain amount of stoicism to will and i mean that in the in the philosophical stoicism where he's really you know really looking at things as what can i address what can i fix okay i can't fix this but i can put these mitigation strategies in place okay, I can fix this, so I will. So he's incredibly assertive, because he has to be, because his mum is not. You know, he takes charge of the situations. He's built up in these in this first chapter as basically what you could consider a born leader, but out of necessity. And yeah, you know, that, that last one in particular, in particular is that very stoic attitude. Is um, This doesn't make them any less real. The reality of them is not his concern. His concern is that that he needs to make sure that she has the best ride of it. It's almost a reversal of the classic parental relationship. 
in in a manner as he's getting to the point where he can actually start doing things on his own he's taking over the care role and he's just saying okay what can i you know what can i do to make this better i can't i can't tell her that these things don't exist because that doesn't help because it doesn't matter what matters is that i need to make sure that she pays the bills or you know i need to i need to make sure that if she's going to count this thing, we, we make sure we count it together so we can double check and we can just say, okay, we've definitely counted there were 27 slats in this bench, and you, which which are kind of, these sorts of things are classic uh, mitigation strategies for this sort of thing anyway. But yeah, it's, it's just interesting to see how very, very practical he is. I also just like that line um, about when he says that made them no less real, no less frightening and dangerous, because I feel like that's... Um a concept that people today can't wrap their head around that mental illnesses are real. And this is just like a throwaway line almost in this book that this kid understood that whatever his mom was afraid of was real just because he wasn't afraid of it just because he couldn't see it or experience it. It was real. And that's how he had to approach the situation. Yeah. So it wasn't just a practical thing. It was it that's huge because people don't get that today. Yeah, it's really interesting, you know, that that mental illness is real. And he just he he just got it and knew exactly how to, how to deal with their lives. It was it's really that line that I remember when you asked about how the mental illness was treated in the books. I said, I thought that they were treated all right. And it was really that one line that made me think that. Yeah. And in a, a book where not everything aged super well, it's actually like. Yeah. really amazing that this part i'm sure it was ahead of its time in the 90s and it's like still kind of ahead of where we are on mental illness in a lot of ways culturally yeah so like kudos to him for that yeah it, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter how real the stimuli are that are making these bad feelings happening the bad feelings are still happening and thus must be dealt with which is uh yeah, yeah. as you say the kind of uh, eventually the most understandable way to deal with it is to separate the reality of the situation from the reality of the feelings. And I think that yeah. what happens later in the story, uh, like in the in the chapters where Will and Lyra are together, is that once again, he takes that idea of a, a kind of menace that uh, is not sensible to Will, not, not anything that he can perceive, but that is still believed in uh, by him and, and has to be kind of mitigated, like you said. And he literalizes that in a magical way in the form of the specters, which all of the children believe is real and is a real thing that is attacking the adults of Sidigatse, but uh, which none of them can perceive. In which all of them are trying to, like, those kids are trying to protect their brother from the specters, um, even though they can't sense them. They do believe that they're real and they're protecting their brother in exactly the same way, but in a literal, magical way that Will was doing with his mother. It's an important parallel you just brought up. It's going to come back. <laughs> so let's uh, wrap her up. That phrase just struck me as super fucking Canadian, but uh, let's, <laughs> let's finish this up. Yeah. Let's have a craft dinner and wrap her up. Yeah. Yeah. And on that note, uh, join us next time for chapters four through six. If you like our show, please take some time to leave us a rating or a review on Apple Podcasts. I'm Anya, and you can follow me on Twitter at Strangely Literal. That's Strangely, then L I T E R L. I'm Caitlin, and you can follow me on Twitter at Inferior Caitlin. I'm Francis, and you can follow me on Twitter at Francis Windrum. Follow the show on Twitter at MOTPod. If you need more than 280 characters to speak your mind, you can send your emails to contact at hollowedgroundmedia.com. And remember to always make friends with murderers. Welcome to Measures of Truth, a His Dark Materials podcast. I'm Caitlin. I'm Alan. No? I'm <laughs> I'm Francis. Perfect. Okay. <clears throat>
Seraphina mercy kills the other witch, fights her way out of the ship, and then goes to visit the witch and- Can you hear my cat screaming? Sorry. Let me just let her out. That's fine. Mysterious fifth host. Okay. Um, You've already added a mysterious fourth host. It was a bad idea then. Yeah. What? Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're just gonna- this. <laughs> The the podcast is just going to keep adding hosts every every season. It's fine. Um, <laughs> as long as they're all like animal, yeah. Is this could be. A, it's actually a D and D session. Now. <laughs> it's just a demon. A demon. Seraphina mercy I am kills. Unprepared. The... Have not rolled my character. <laughs> We're not even going to talk about Ser- it. We'll We're go over just that. Gonna... Yeah. Can I go now? So originally in the notes, Anya had written. Yeah, that oh, that kind of. We are way no. off. That's okay. Um, that's okay. You're good with me going. Yeah. Okay. So uh, well, originally Alan, in the notes, Anya something. had. Oh my god. <laughs> Mm-mm, Caitlin. Go. Okay. Also, just as a really quick aside, is someone actually building an entire tower block in the background of someone's? recording oh that that might be me <laughs> i'm playing with stuff in my hand that's clicking no the i don't th- i don't think so it definitely sounds like building like it's got an echo yeah Who it knows? sounds like kind of far away and construction-y i blame anya yeah i mean my whole city <laughs> is under mandatory lockdown so <laughs> Oh, that's fair, actually. <laughs> Although the trains are still running, it, I'm sure so... It's me. I'll try to be more still. <gasps> Shit. Oh, my God. Sorry, a piece of, like, my mic stand just fell onto my hand, and I thought it was all gonna collapse. It scared the fucking shit out of me. Everything's fine, though. Carry on. That sounded really cool, so can we <laughs> use that as, like... Just, just leave that in. I'll, I'll put it at the end, just for you. Uh, the other day, I forget why or what was happening, but somebody said I reminded them of one of the ants from Practical Magic, and I was like, that's the best compliment a person has ever given me. That is very bad. (laughs) Yeah. That sentence went in a very different direction than I expected, given (laughs) the word ants, and... Anyway, never mind. Insects. Would aunt? I was with would you. Would aunt yeah, yeah. make you feel better? Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't say that with a serious expression on my face. Aunt. 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 <laughs> Sorry. You want to try again? Aunt. No, no, I'm done. <laughs>